Uh, good afternoon. As they say, this is the, the test of a real moderator is to run the panel after the lunch session, right? So here I am. Uh, thank you all for uh, being with us. And we have some very interesting panelists today. So why don't I quickly introduce the panel, and then I'll, uh, we'll jump into the discussion. Uh, my first panelist today is uh, a carrier banker. Uh, he's worked with uh, many global banks, HSBC, GE, uh, First Rand Bank, and now is the country head for Doha Bank India. Please welcome Manish, Manish Mathur on stage. Manish. <laughs> welcome, Manish. Uh, my second panelist today, uh, we have a banker. So maybe we should talk about a technologist uh, who has actually worn multiple hats uh, as a technologist. He's worked with, uh, in the core banking space with uh, firms like Infosys, in the payment space with firms like FSS, and now actually heads, he's an SVP and heads product innovation at Kia.ai, Manoj, Manoj Chopra. Welcome. <laughs> So we had a banker, and we had a we have a technologist. Uh, it's time to also have someone who's actually a techno banker, uh, someone who's actually worked with multiple organizations, including I2 Credit Suez, Samsung. Uh, was earlier the founder of uh, he's been a founder of two interesting fintechs. Uh, presently, the founder and CEO for Bharat Next, which is a B2B payments on credit cards uh, fintech. Akshat Akshat Billa. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so I'm, the discussion today is actually on um, instant payments, uh, quote unquote, the flag bearer of digital banking. And we saw some very interesting conversations this morning. Uh, in, irrespective of what the topic of the discussion was, uh, it eventually gravitated and steered towards uh, payments. And, uh, and then we are now talking about more specifically on instant payments. So I'll probably start with you, uh, Akshat. Uh, I think, you know, if you could actually help define the concept of instant payments. Uh, and since you actually are an innovator at heart, if you can talk about what's the continued innovation and success that we have been experiencing as a country in this space. No, no, absolutely. I mean, this is a, is a very big question. But I think, you know, to answer that question, we'll have to go all the way back to 300 BC, when we had coins invented, right? Coins was the most primitive form of instant payments. You traded goods, you, said, you gave coins, and you know, voila, instant payments are formed, right? And as we graduated towards more convenience and towards more inclusiveness, um, we started moving away slowly from instant payments. So we go back 17th century when notes were invented. Then once notes were there, then we gave, came into checks. And checks, of course, they gave a lot of convenience, uh, ability to pay later, but also brought in uh, the whole concept of delayed payments as well, right? And then go down the route where, you know, first credit cards are issued, 19th, almost, almost like 20th century is when digital payments started to sort of take shape, right? But it was not until the 21st century that we saw semblance of instant payments come in. Um, so IMPS was born in 2010, uh, basically, your uh, uh, the CTS systems came in in 2011, and all of these things started to happen, right? So this was basically where we started to see that okay, payments can be instant again, and it does just is not cash which is instant, right? And and to give you some context, how many of you ha here have cash in your wallets? Just raise hands. <laughs> Congratulations, you have a 17th century artifact in your wallet. <laughs> I mean, this is how far back cash is going, and it's still not disrupted with, I mean, yes, we have achieved a lot, right? I mean, if, if I go into sort of where we are at now, so, you know, just, just contextualizing where we are at. Um, we do about 50 million checks a month, 100 million PPI transactions, 220 million debit card, 230 million credit cards. Um, 400 million wallet transactions, or 500 almost. Right, and which is wallet was the first time that we started to see real instant payments at the merchant level as well. 
right? I mean, the driver of a lot of the payments was at the merchant level, and that's when we started to see that happen, right? And we all know what demonetization and essentially UPI has done to that. Right from 2016 going on to almost about 2021, we were already at 10x of wallet transactions. And even as we speak now, all the other transactions together is about a billion transactions in a month. UPI is close to 9 billion transactions in a month. And UPI is the one which has really sort of helped us transform where we are at from a digital payments perspective. And then we can talk more about what the implications are, but we all know what's happened, right? I mean, right from, it took about 70 years to, or, or, or for us to get to almost about 75 million POS terminals. It took us seven years to get to 250 million QR codes. That's a staggering number to sort of uh, look at how what digital has done and what a lot of it is through instant payments, right? I mean, the instant payment aspect and of course, the fee-less nature uh, of, of UPI is really what has driven uh, this growth for us. Fee-less. There's, there's no fees. No fees, fee-less, okay. So, so post, post system, both cashless, credit cards, debit cards, everything, there is, there is a charge. Both cashless and fee-less is where we are moving towards. Cashless, yes, of course. <laughs> but what has driven cashless is the fee-less. Is the fee-less. Right? But I mean, the bankers here will, will definitely not be happy with that because I saw some stat there about the banks and all the ecosystem combined together is burning about 1,200 crores a month to support the transactions. Yeah. And, and just to tell you, I mean, how difficult uh, instant payments are, right? I mean, so there are four party system in a UPI, right? And there are about 10 API calls that happen on a single UPI transaction, be it one rupee, be it one lakh. Now, multiply that by 9 billion transactions a month. That's 90 billion API calls, right? For the technologists out there would really appreciate what the scale of this thing is, which is 3 billion API calls a day. And that's a free infrastructure that we have created, right? To enable instant payments, really, right? I mean, that's, and it's riding on the NPCI's IMPS platform. Yeah. But I mean, just, just a flavor of what instant payment entails, right? And, with instant payment, what can we achieve? So cash is, of course, the most primitive form of instant payments. Where we're heading is a very exciting space. Fascinating. No, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I think it's, it's one thing to say fee less and moving away from less fees. But, uh, but I, I, I guess uh, considering that such an investment has been made, and I'll take this question to you, Manish. It's one thing to say that we actually are having these staggering numbers of transactions, you know, driven by digital payments, right? But that's actually from a from a technologist view, right? I mean, as as someone who's actually engaging as a banker, uh, both with uh, consumers and businesses, uh, how would you see the impact uh, that this is creating for the the segment that is enjoying the benefits of it, which is ultimately the the customers, be it institutions or individuals or the economy as a whole? How would you actually take a look at that? Right. Uh, thanks. So I think uh, I will obviously distinguish uh, when we talk about digital payments. You know, I would like to distinguish cash from digital payments. I think we are talking about, I think I'll probably look at it from a perspective of all digital payments which are, which are not non-cash, I mean, or, or not an instant, or not an instant payment, or, or cash is not an instant payment. So I think I think the key benefit, obviously, from a customer's perspective, is that you know there is flexibility and convenience uh, in terms of making the payments. You can probably manage your funds better, both from investment and cost perspective. But I think more importantly, I would feel that you know the fact that there is an audit trail that gets created every time you do a transaction. So you know to to actually support uh, any subsequent claims, you know, it becomes much easier. Uh, with the with the uh, digital payments that we have now put in place, which was probably missing earlier, the other thing, obviously, you know, from a from an Indian economy perspective, uh, has also been that you know it has also triggered uh, you know financial inclusion and mm. you know better transmission of government policies to citizens, uh, because uh, obviously. Uh, you know, we we did open the Aadhaar, we did, we did open the accounts, the Aadhaar accounts, and all of that. But I think the fact that digital payments came along and became a necessity from a business perspective, as well as to receive the benefits that the government wanted to give, I think that is really what has triggered the 
interest of the customers to really, uh, you know, utilize the benefit of, uh, you know, the Aadhaar accounts that were opened and all of that. So I think, I think those are the few, I think, key benefits, I think. The other benefit I feel, obviously, it's an evolving situation right now. But uh, obviously, some of the instant payments also uh, give you an authentication of the beneficiary, mm. which also, I think, is, was always a little bit of a concern uh, originally, you know, you were paying out the cash, uh, you know, in, in a lot of circumstances, when you were not sure, you know, who's the actual recipient, uh, whether it's the right person you should be paying this money to or whatever. So that, that I think, uh, is also uh, obviated to a certain extent. And the last is obviously, you know, uh, not having to carry the cash. I mean, I think uh, you don't run into that security issue. Obviously, with instant payments, there are different type of security Correct. issues that we need to look at. Sure. Uh, but, you know, just the, the concern that people would have, you know, in case they had to do a large value transaction to carry the cash, get it transmitted, all that is sort of avoided, you know, as far as Fascinating. So you see this impact both from a transparency standpoint, uh, it creates uh, financial inclusion, so it's a larger economy that's yes. participating. It avoids the parallel economy, so it creates a, a audit trail driven, yes. you know, is what's actually non-repudiation is an area of, uh, yep. of benefit. But at, in the, at the heart of all of this, and I'm taking this question to you there, Manoj, and you know, you've been an innovation guy, right? Uh, I think we had uh, Akshat talk a lot about you know, how the journey has been from many centuries, so now we are actually at now, the power of now at instant, as we call it. So if you were to pick something as the hallmark of this innovation, uh, and how digital payments has demonstrated that, uh, how would you actually articulate your thought, your views on those? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, I think there have been several hallmarks of innovation that have kind of transpired to make instant payments successful. So uh, uh, if you look at over the last couple of years, there have been multiple um, multiple payment instruments, payment methods, there have been various form factors and there has been a lot of innovation around that. Uh, but if I have to just look at one of the most significant and most overarching innovations that have impacted the lives of people, I think is the digital payments infrastructure that has been set up by the government. I think uh, if, if you look at it, uh, everything that we are doing today is, is riding on the rails that have been provided by this by this infrastructure, so you you know you call maybe it Aadhaar or it you know PKYC or most recently now the the account aggregator framework, all of that I think uh, has been has been very very significant. If you look at Aadhaar for example, uh, uh, which is the unique uh, identity that all of us have, and that has really helped in creating a number of Jandan accounts, which is close to about 47, 48 crore. Jandan accounts, I think, maybe as on as on last month. But if you really look at the success of UPI, Jandan accounts has been one of the key factors that has kind of resulted in in uh, in the success of UPI. So UPI, you know, uh, these Jandan accounts have helped you help the prolifer proliferation of UPI. But UPI itself has been one of the outcomes of the digital payment infrastructure itself. So. Uh, uh, and there are uh, there have been significant innovations around UPI itself, and and UPI NPCI continues to innovate around UPI, right? And you have almost a new product coming every quarter, if not every month. So, uh, and most recently, you know, uh, just just about a week back, uh, RBI has enabled uh, uh, loan accounts where you can transact through UPI. So you can you have your uh, credit credit lines which can be utilized through UPI itself. Uh, so uh, I think that is that is the second thing, and third I think is a very very significant insignificant thing or a significant thing, so to say, but which all of us ignore and which I think um, Akshat also mentioned um, is the QR code. I think hmm. uh, which uh, you know all of us it's it's part of our daily lives, but the innovation or the I mean whoever created the QR code, I mean the kind of impact it has had, the kind of uh, you know uh, reach it has had with different start of people today i mean we can't imagine uh, doing an instant payment without a qr code i mean you can but <laughs> but most of us you know kind of can't live without a qr code now so yeah, I, think I think that is very true i mean um, uh, i mean there have been um, 
rage about how QR codes are actually being carried by the, you know, the, the vegetable cart Absolutely. vendor or the auto rickshaw guy or… Yeah, yeah. No, I, I guess, uh, I mean, one can't agree more that, in fact, going back to the reference we make in, in the panel this morning, we had uh, Shekhar from Kotak talking about what he called as jam, right? The Jandan, Aadhaar and mobility being the three, you know, pillars of what uh, this innovation has been about. But I want to come this, bring this question back uh, uh, to you, Akshay. And, you know, we, you, you talked about how things have evolved over the centuries. Uh, but we now have the, the next, uh, quote-unquote, innovation on the digital rupee that's coming up, right? So how could that impact, you know, in your view, both the instant payment space and more specifically on, um, you know, the payment space and more specifically the instant payment space? Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think e-rupee is, is a very fascinating debate, right? Because if you look at what has been achieved from a billion transactions, we've gone to 10 billion thanks to UPI, right? And you would think that, you know, a lot of digital payments are now happening on these platforms that have been enabled, the infrastructure that has been enabled. But if you then step aside and say, hey, what's happened to cash, right? Cash was 17 lakh crores pre-demonetization. Where are we now? We're double of that. We're 32, 33 lakh crore of cash, even now, despite all these transactions happening. So there is something which is missing, right? And, and uh, Mr. Manish alluded to that. The whole digital ecosystem brings in traceability, right? Helps you immensely. But there is still a segment which is saying, hey, I don't want this traceability. I love my cash. I want to spend it. I don't want anybody to monitor it where my cash is going. And for RBI, this is a big problem. This is a 5,000 crore problem. Printing cash a year is 5,000 crores for them. If digital is not going to take it away and people still want a anonymity, right? The whole thesis is, can we bring in something which brings that anonymity and also moves in with the time? The time of crypto payments or blockchains, right? Which is where the whole e rupee has come in, saying, hey, we'll have a central uh, uh, blockchain currency on a distributed ledger. But the only difference is going to be from a cryptocurrency, there is going to be a central regulator managing the flow and supply of funds. So they're creating a two-layer almost uh, ecosystem, which is saying that, hey, we will give you wallets to everybody. Mm. You will have money in your wallet, and central bank will basically be the custodian of that money. And decide that, okay, you know, if you were getting 50,000, I mean, they're they are the ones who are sort of saying, okay, you I got I promise 50, to pay the bearer the way you actually read it in a rupee note in any case. Yeah. What's that? I promise to pay the bearer of this yeah, note. Yeah, some correct. Of exactly. Exactly. The notes. Right? And what you do with that money is not something which is going to be traceable by any bank. Right? So you can go spend that money and that portion of your wallet is going to be managed by the distributed ledger. So your, le you know, whatever transactions you've got done is basically managed by the distributed ledger. No bank, no intermediary has access to that. That's your cash, non-traceable. But at the end of the day, it's going to be something they hope will replace the cash. I mean, that's how I am seeing it. And, and essentially, it's very fascinating to see how this pans out. Obviously, they're in, in pilot phases right now. Correct. And adoption of something like this, if it's not in tier two, tier three, tier four cities, is going to be difficult to sort of replace Will this, uh, Do you see this reviving the wallets again? This is the wallet. This is the wallet. This is the, the wallet. The definition of the wallet, yeah. Because essentially, I mean, it's, it's funny because they moved away from wallets and they sort of brought in UPI. Correct. But now they're moving back to a system which is wallet and almost giving you anonymity and non-traceability, which is, which is counterintuitive, but actually if you think about it, it's a brilliant move. Yeah. How it pans out is, is a big question mark. Is yeah. what we'll have to wait and watch. I'll take this question to Manish, and this is something which uh, we do a lot of work around the world, right, at CEDA. And uh, uh, when we talk to bankers outside of India, uh, uh, there is actually a lot of, uh, lot of let's say, uh, anxiety or excitement, the way you look at it, about what UPI will have to do or what impact it has to have on cross-border, you know, uh, transactions, right? Uh, and with UPI being accepted or, let's say, being participated in by more and more countries around the world, uh, what impact would you foresee on, on cross-border payments particularly? Yeah. No, yeah, I think, I think it's quite fascinating. I think, and uh, as I was mentioning, I think it's probably the first time that India is really taking a lead, uh, you know, in, in 
bringing about a technology which really shakes the payment systems across the world. Uh, and I think, uh, obviously, you know, with, with uh, and what I understand is I think NPCI is actually proactively, you know, targeting other geographies and saying, you know, we can offer the UPS solution, set it up for you for free, uh, just to encourage, uh, you know, sort of uh, more appreciation and acceptance of the UPI platform. Uh, so obviously, you know, from a customer perspective, uh, you know, it will make things far easier. Uh, I mean, the, the remittances can be faster. Uh, they can be more uh, predictable. People can probably manage their accounts uh, overseas as well as in India much better. But I think a fundamental thing uh, from our perspective will also be that, uh, you know, I think this may encourage more uh, transactions in the rupee. And I think rupee will also get more a bigger status, I would say, as a as a global currency. I mean, I wouldn't say uh, it'll start probably comparing with dollars immediately, but I'm just saying that it'll be another currency that will be in the reckoning. And I think that I think is a is a bigger bigger spin off, uh, you know, for all of us, because you know, first of all, obviously, you know, I think that can probably lead to more flexibility on the capital account side as well, because you know, then the government can manage its fiscal or you know current account deficit specifically, uh, you know, much better. Uh, and, you know, uh, in, in that sense, you know, there is no exchange rate risk, you know, once you are sending the money out, uh, you know, that, that's something which the, which the RBA can control. So I think, I think that, I think, is, I think it just gives a more, a bigger prominence to India as a country as well. And I think that I see is probably, you know, the biggest spin-off uh, benefit that you will get, uh, you know, besides the, the convenience, obviously, that their customers will enjoy. But, you know, you have systems, I mean, obviously, SWIFT is now integrated in all banking systems, and SWIFT is, I mean, primarily running on those three, four legacy currencies, uh, you know, historically. And the ability for any other currency to really make a dent into that space is, is not, has not, has not been possible. Obviously, you know, they've introduced CLS and things like that. But, you know, still, most of the trade still happening in those currencies itself. Correct. I think this will really, that, that this can really change that metric as well. Because, you know, you can actually have an offering, you know, which is probably superior to what is possible, you know, through SWIFT or through CLS. And that's something which will probably, you know, should drive greater acceptance of the rupee as an alternative currency. So you could actually get into CLS as a currency on your, on your own. And similarly, on the SWIFT, probably, you know, there will be more transactions. I think that, I think, I see as the biggest sort of... So that's a very, uh, should I say, uh, profound, you know, point of view that you have just shared. I'm sure all the people in the audience there are... Uh, I'm sure there may be questions coming up later today, but uh, I'll, I'll hold back on that, Manish, and I'll take this question to you, Manoj, and uh, I'm, I'm going to just borrow from what uh, Akshat was talking about, right? I mean, if you look at the kind of transaction volume of UPI we're dealing with, right? Uh, every transaction calling as many APIs, and, and some estimation says that we actually almost have like 2,500 transactions every second. Just imagine, every second, there are 2,500 transactions being being you know transacted somewhere in this country, and and you pointed out, Akshat, that there is a lot of rails that have been laid, but there's a lot lot of uh, technology behind it that's invisible, and there is uh, a lot of uh, effort that's gone behind or is working behind. Could you throw some light on what the technology is, you know, for for us in the audience and to understand where we are heading in in terms of that technology? Yeah. So. Uh, at scale, I think uh, that's the point. Yeah, so I think this 2,500 that you mentioned is just a few couple of months back. If you look at the <laughs> March numbers, it's it's 3,000 transactions. There you go. Per second. So, I mean, that really kind of explains the scale at which um, the uh, UPI transactions are growing. So, indeed, you know, you have close to about eight, March, we had 8.6 billion transactions that were done. If you look at January numbers from during the COVID times, from Jan 21 to 22, the number of transactions doubled actually. And then in the last one year, it's close to about, it's grown about 60-70%, but obviously with a higher base. So that, if you look at now, about 75-80% of digital retail transactions are, are UPI transactions. Um, I was just kind of, I heard uh, one of our Indian you know, cabinet ministers quote in the 
World Economic Forum that if you if you look at the value of transactions on the instant uh, on the instant payment platform in India, and if you com if you compare with uh, U.S., U.K., Germany, and France put together, if you take all these four countries, take the value of these transactions and multiply by four, instant payments in India is much more than that. So that's the scale at 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 which we operate. And and from a from a Kia perspective as well, I mean we we do about eight nine banks. We process close to about 25% of of the volumes on on um, on UPI today, and there's a there's a lot of heavy lifting that goes behind the scenes in processing. Like Akshat already mentioned, there is there are about 10 API calls when just to kind of service one one UPI transaction. Uh, so uh, uh, and and what also kind of uh, complicates matters a little bit is that UPI is almost as kind of, it's not making money for banks, right? And so banks are kind of cautious in investing into technologies for UPI. I'm not saying they're not investing, but there is a kind of guarded response to, uh, you know, investing. So as technology service providers, you know, our challenge is that, you know, we've got to kind of keep innovating. There is uh, the investments on hardware are, you no, know, it's difficult to get those investments, but so we need to keep innovate, innovating on the product side. So uh, uh, that's that's really one of the biggest challenges, and there is a lot of monitoring, and and it's good from a consumer perspective, right? If you look at there's so much of monitoring from NPCI, from uh, from METI, there is every every technical decline, every downtime, everything is tracked, everything is questioned. So uh, there is a you know lot of kind of checks and balances that are there in the system. So having said that, I think the the volumes are are only going to grow. NPCI itself has set a target of one billion transactions a day, uh, which is <laughs> you know in the next two to three years. So, uh, so we are about 30 crore right now to about 100 crore a day. So it's three x in the next three to four years. So, and and it's 100 percent going to grow if you look at the kind of products that NPCI is coming up with, if you look at a uh, credit card on Rupee, or if you look at now, most recently now, uh, the loan accounts which you will be able to service using uh, U UPI or UPI Lite, all that put together, it's, it, I mean that, we are going to just reach that target sooner rather than later. So that's a most, kind of it's going to happen very soon. And uh, I think it's up to technology providers, I mean we need to keep innovating and so there's a lot of innovation happening around microservices architecture, you know, containerized applications. We've recently moved our switch now to a completely microservices architecture, a complete containerized solution. So uh, there's a lot to happen. It's very exciting and challenging as well. I was just going to add one quick thing to uh, what he said, right? It's fascinating that it's not the cost of doing any business right now, it's the cost of not doing it. Can the banks afford not to do a UPI, Absolutely. despite the cost not the the, the cost structure is not being there for them? Yes. Because imagine if ICIC has stopped doing UPI, all the other banks are going to be super happy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> no, I, I, I guess it's a measure of opportunity cost versus real cost, right? And I think that's what the that's the game at play here. But I, I guess uh, there's a lot of discussion about what the projections are and what the real volume is and as you say the future is landing even before you expect it uh, in terms of scale that you are you're seeking i mean what does this mean for let's say the uh, you know opportunities that are laying ahead of us right i mean we you know there were some discussions in the morning that we had where somebody talked about how uh, you know we actually see digital lending actually becoming critical because payments data serves as a very important fuel for driving, let's say, credit quality, credit decisions, and how that's un unfolding. Somebody, we had another, uh, you know, uh, fireside chat that uh, Nikhil was moderating on how unbanked segment is actually being, you know, becoming more inclusive, right? So my last question is actually on those lines, right? I mean, and, and this is maybe a rapid fire, if I may say that, and then we could open up for questions from audience. If you were to pick, you know, one you know, opportunity that you foresee that all of this is likely to bring to all of us in the future, uh, what would that be? So, you want to start with you? Akshay. Yeah, I mean, see again, as you said, uh, the whole India stack, and as he also alluded to, the whole fact, the India stack has really enabled the payments to be at the core, right? And with payments and everybody doing digital payments, 
and hopefully the traceability remains, right? Because what that does is gives everybody this whole digital collateral. So a chai wala or a vegetable vendor has a digital collateral saying, hey, this is the amount of transactions I'm doing. This is my daily galla, right? And this is basically how much I'm doing and the historical relevance of the whole thing. Now I don't need a credit score to underwrite him. Lending is by far going to be the one of the biggest winners from the payment space, right? And even if payment is not making money, and payment is essentially more sort of the data store for a lot of the mm. banks. Mm. No bank will, you know, stop doing UPI or enabling these payments because the amount of data they can get from this to in turn use it as data collateral and lend is going Fair. to be immense. Fair. No, I think there was a comment this morning, someone was indicating that uh, credit to GDP is at 40% and it is likely to go to 100. So if you're talking about two and a half X, improvement in digital lending. Thank you, Akshat. If I take it to you there, Manoj. No, absolutely. I think, I think the amount of data, like uh, Akshat mentioned, the amount of data that banks hold today, the payments data or the transaction data, that's, that's invaluable. I mean, absolutely. And uh, there is, there, I mean, if you kind of just put an analytics engine to it and you, if you kind of have the right ML platform, you kind of can get a very, 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 very significant inferences from that data. And that can again, you know, write, for example, you, uh, uh, right now people who have credit histories and transaction patterns, they, they are able to get uh, lending done, but, but a chaiwala on the, on the street, I mean, he doesn't have a credit score. So for him, I think it, this can lead to a, a, a huge uh, kind of benefit from a financial inclusion perspective. I think that, uh, that is something that is, you know, really going to be... Uh, and, and plus the RBI thing, I mean, I, I mentioned this earlier as well, and I, and I think we're just kind of uh, probably not realizing the, uh, or, or yet to realize the importance of uh, the credit lines being exposed to UPI. And there is, it can actually work like a credit card. Um, uh, though we probably have to see how, you know, banks will provide a 30-day free credit and hmm. how the transaction points would be kind of… Yeah. Taken care of, yeah. But 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 otherwise, I mean, it's it's that that's going to be the next wave. So credit card and and um, and and loans being exposed to UPI, I, I think those are going to be, you know, really the next wave. I believe. I could see Akshat already getting ideas for his yeah. next yeah. next yeah. next venture. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, Manish, your turn. Uh, well, I think yeah, I think I agree that I think uh, obviously the kind of. Uh, uh, transaction history that you're getting created, I think that's obviously going to be very useful uh, for banks because obviously, you know, when you when historically, you know, we have been looking at uh, customer performance from a historical perspective at one point of time, you know, so so the balance sheet is as of 31st March and that's it. I mean, you know, we don't know what happened and obviously the customers uh, have their own interpretations of why things have moved in a certain way and all of that. So I think that subjectivity is taken out of that assessment, you know, once you start seeing more granular data on, on their transactions, I think that enables credit monitoring better. But I think more on a broader level, I think it also probably will help uh, the government or, you know, uh, to, to actually drive policies. Mm -hmm. You know, suppose you actually take a decision in the budget to say that, okay, you know, should I reduce my tax rates? You know, I think you can actually see the outcome of that, you know, maybe in the next three months, you know, how does it impact the cash flows? Where are the money now going? Where is the money now going? You know, I mean, is there a significant change in the consumption uh, that the that the customers are actually doing, or is it going more towards investments? You know, the more you know, you get into situation where there is an audit trail of transactions done by individual citizens. I think which was probably missing, you know, historically. I think that I think will drive the policy uh, much much better in terms of you know effectiveness. You will, you will actually be able to monitor what is the outcome of your policies and that will probably be a feedback loop for, for the governments to actually, you know, fine tune their uh, actions going forward. So I think that I think will also be a, a big benefit that we so could probably That's a very derive. interesting point. Better data, better insights, yeah, better decisions. Yeah, you yeah. have this data and now you have this big data analysis capabilities, Correct. you know, which probably earlier it was not easy for you to do it in such a desegregated fashion. But now you can do that. So I think that I think, uh, you know, and I think income tax has already started doing that, right? I yeah. think they, they start looking at all your high value transactions and, you know, they've, they've asked people to confirm that, you know, all these. So I think, but that means they're already proactively looking at all of their data. And I think that will be quite useful, I think, to just drive, uh, drive you know, 
the, the policies going forward. That I think will be, it will make the whole politics and all that, you know, I think It'll data driven, made more data driven. <laughs> data driven you know, politics. Yeah. So it'll not just be, <laughs> it'll not just be, you know, empty promises. You know, uh, you'll have to demonstrate like that. what you already commit. You know. Well, we have uh, time for just one or two questions. So anyone, I see one. Can someone hand the mic to him, please? I think uh, I've given my point of view from a fintech perspective, but I would like to hear from a banking and banker perspective. So this is a question to Mr. Manish. Uh, do you see? I mean, with the digital intervention happening uh, in a very rapid uh, speed, do you see the bank's investment is going to be towards the branches or a technology stacks? Yeah. No. So I think I think definitely uh, the emphasis on branches will reduce. Uh, there is no question about that. I think uh, the way I see it is that you know what probably payments will now become more of a service. It it will not be a profit center for banks. I think historically, you know, that was it was also a profit center. I think now banks will have to focus more on their, you know, their credit capabilities, ability to manage the asset liability mismatches. I think that's what will determine how successful a bank will be. Uh, clearly, I think I don't think uh, banks. Obviously, you will have to have some branches because I think there is this mental comfort a lot of people get just by knowing that the bank actually exists you know it is not a it is not just a thing on on the web you know because there, there are there are neo banks right i mean which which don't have any physical presence also you know and but you know i don't know whether there'll be a that that will appeal to everybody i think so there will be some space for some branches but definitely the owner the, the number of branches will definitely come down that's that's my view yeah. one last question and go up there, yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for a very insightful session. I think this was, uh, we, we, I, as an audience, I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, we discussed, you discussed about uh, digital rupee, uh, you know, the impact of that, and we'll obviously see how that pans out. But as a banker, um, Shamanish, how do you think that that will have an impact on, you know, uh, from a 10 year, 20 year perspective uh, on the role of a bank? Right. So as we see today, uh, for example, a Google Pay, which was a search organization, controls 40% of UPI market. So and a bank is basically a server uh, for them in a very layman's term, but it's basically a database for them. So do you think that the role of bank will change uh, as we go ahead in, in tw 10 or 20 years of span of time? Yeah, so I think that's what I was alluding to. I think the, the, the function of a bank as a store of cash or you know storekeeper of cash so to say i think that will really diminish but i think the banks will still continue to perform the other functions i think the main function or i think the the critical function that the bank has to provide is to manage the asset liability position you are getting deposits which are probably short term and you are lending long term or vice versa i mean it could change in certain in cases of certain banks but but broadly that is the situation so I think how that, that function, I think the banks will have to continue to perform. Similarly, trade transactions, you know, to, to give the comfort that you understand the risk of the counterparty better than the person who's actually doing the trade transaction. I think that's again a value add that the bank will continue to provide. So I think those kind of functions, they will have to continue to provide. But yeah, anything which is related to just holding cash you know, which was historically one of the functions that bank used to perform. I think that, I think, is going to really diminish. Mm. Thank you, Manish. I think at the end of this session, I guess all of us are looking to see what the new cashless, fee-less, and now we're talking about bankless. I think we are <laughs> moving in a direction which is all about more and more of less and less. Uh, so thank you, uh, gentlemen. I think it, I really enjoyed having this session. So thank you. <laughs>